Well, and then I forgot where I put it. Okay, last time we were talking about flames and stuff, but we had been talking about cost of welding, and, and this is in one of the uh, handouts, but I didn't uh, forget to put this thing up. Um, we talked about the capital equipment costs in dollars going from 10 to the third to 10 to the sixth, and a flame might be $1,000 to get a good oxyacetylene flame cutting with two tanks and a good torch and things like that. And arcs might be $10,000 and laser and electron beams, full-size systems, industrially it could be you know millions of dollars, a uh, million dollars easy and, and going up. Well, it turns out resistance welding has an equivalent, it's an internal heating process rather than a surface heating process, but if I look at the speed of welding, centimeters of weld per second that I can do, I can do 10 centimeters a second if I had to with uh, resistance welding, okay? I can get much higher rates. Um, and it turns out that uh, um, resistance welding, you can buy that equipment for 10, 20, 30,000 dollars. And so it turns out resistance welding is significantly cheaper per, per length of weld. Now it's only good for sheet metal, but this turns out to be the reason why we resistance weld automobiles. It's much, much cheaper than arc welding or laser and electron beam. Remember the automotive industry, they've got enough volume, they could, they could keep these busy. The reason they don't arc weld, I mean they do a little bit of arc welding, but in general arc welding for them is very expensive and it really gets down to the capital cost of the equipment. You have to have lots of uh, systems operating so far as that goes. Okay, so I just want to cover that. Then we talked about the flame temperatures are controlled by the enthalpy of the reaction, the oxygen fuel ratio, stoichiometry, and the presence of inerts, usually nitrogen, with the air. Pure oxygen flames burn with 10 times the heat intensity of an air flame. If I took propane or oxyacetylene, or not oxyacetylene, but acetylene, and I burn one of them in air, and then I take the same fuel and burn it in uh, pure oxygen, I'll get about a tenfold increase. I get about a three times temperature increase, and remember three squared is ten, right? You guys learned that the other day, right? Well, 3.1 something is squared, or 3.08 squared is ten, right? So, to the first significant figure, Three squared is ten, right? Okay, the gas boundary layer greatly limits the heating of the surface. We're going to talk about how to get around that. There's two different ways, uh, two different types of processes to get around that. And then we mentioned that acetylene, even though it has only about a 230 degree higher flame temperature, um, has a 30 percent more heat given to the surface than um, methyl acetylene propadiene, which is C3H4. And then I told you that I'd forgotten to bring in my uh, acetylene cylinder. This is what's called a B-cylinder size of acetylene tank. Okay, I have a couple of these in my garage with little acetylene setups that I have when I need to uh, do something. Uh, this one's been split by the manufacturer, so it displays this, I couldn't remember what it was, it's calcium silicate. Okay, uh, and this, this, material in here is 92% porous. This white stuff in here, I mean, they put the stuff in it. It's actually got pretty good clap strength. Um, but basically, it's, it's a ceramic they designed not to be dense, but to, to designed it to be porous. And you fill this whole thing up with acetone, and it turns out, I was wrong, I think I said 150 PSI, and maybe 400 PSI that acetylene goes, uh, uh, self-ignites and, and uh, explosively decomposes. Um, typical acetylene tank pressure is about 250, I was reading this morning. Um, and at 250 PSI, you can store, you can dissolve in acetone about 400 times the acetylene volume, okay? So a typical tank like this would have 400 times the volume, um, as if it was, you know, 400, if, if that was a, just a simple ideal gas compressed, 400 times 15 is lots, right? 6,000 psi. So dissolving in an acetone actually stores more per unit volume than if it was a compressed gas, okay, at 6,000 psi. Typically, most of your compressed gas tanks are around 2,000 psi. So you've got more storage, although the tank is heavy because it's got just calcium silicate. Um, it used to be as calcium silicate asbestos. 
And then in 1982, they had to give the asbestos up. This is post-1982, so it's okay to touch it. Okay. You'll see they got a little piece of felt and they got a little other thing so that the plug doesn't come out. And that's basically how the inside of the acetylene tank works. Now that's called a B-cylinder. And the reason it's called a B-cylinder is because the first uses of acetylene, commercial uses, were for lighting. And it turns out, um, I'll show you the, the flames in a second. Acetylene gas was discovered by Edmund Davy, who I think was a relative of Sir Humphrey Davy, in 1836. But it was not until 1862 when Wohler discovered that acetylene gas could be produced from calcium carbide. In 1892, Thomas L. Wilson of Spray, North Carolina, which is down near the Noose River somewhere, um, invented a process for producing cal calcium carbide. He was looking at electric arcs and trying to synthesize things. He threw um, uh, uh, limestone and coal together in the electric arc and got out calcium carbide. Um, and they devised an economical commercial production method for this. And by 1895, only three years later, acetylene gas was becoming recognized as a valuable gas for lighting. And I told you about the type of piping they'd use for gas for lighting street lights and stuff in Boston and stuff. Originally, it was just logs. We talked about the wooden logs that were gun drilled out and stuff. Um, and here's where it tells me it's 250 PSI is typical cylinder pressure. In 1904, no suitable acetylene container had been developed. So you had to generate it, and then they would pipe it through the ground. So they would generate it by dropping either calcium carbide into water or water drops onto a pile of calcium car carbide. And it, in 1904, it was basically when P.C. Avery uh, got together with guys named James Allison and Carl Fisher in a town called Indianapolis, Indiana. And you ever heard of Detroit Diesel Allison? Okay. And there used to be something at General Motors called Fisher Body, which they're all too young to well. Okay. But there used to be a Fisher Body, okay? Um, body by Fisher. Uh, but those guys um, were in the automobile business, and so they... Uh, set up a little factory in Indianapolis to fabricate that type of tank. Um, and it became the Prestolite Company, because it was for lighting. And that's a B cylinder because it was used on buses. They had two of those on the front of buses. Okay? And it was a B cylinder for a bus. That's the size they put on a bus. And that Prestolite Company later became the Lindy Division of Union Carbide. And um, Carl Fisher and James Allison had their little plant right across from, they actually built this little speedway right across from their plant, which is now the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Okay. Um, and some of that came from the money of selling acetylene uh, cylinders. There are three types of flames, and here's a nice picture in here, although I've got to, I guess I got to, uh, well, I have to cycle through three things here. Okay. I'm going to get some. I don't know if it's going to show up that well. Um, I talked about the. Uh, the the primary and secondary flames. A neutral flame is one that has a very small secondary, and you have this very sharp primary cone, and then there is a light cone out here, but you already see it. I'll pass this around. It'll be better. A carburizing flame is one that has too much gas in it and it has a shorter primary cone, and there is this kind of blue thing sticking out. And here's an oxidizing flame where you got too much oxygen, and the primary cone sticks out a little further. And, and so it turns out this is not stoichiometric for reasons that if you're really interested, I could go into, but and I used to in this course, but it's not that important. So, um, so if you want, you can pass that around. See the three different types of flames. And if you go to a welding school, they'll teach you how to set your torch for each one of those flames. For example, if you're uh, trying to use oxyacetylene to weld um, a bronze, certain types of bronzes, you should uh, use an oxidizing flame. And other types of bronzes, you should use a reducing flame. Um, most cases, you want to use a neutral flame, but, but it varies. Okay, so um, now let's talk about flame cutting.
it turns out one of the reasons that metal fabrication is reasonable in cost, some people say it's not reasonable in cost, <coughs> is because the, the metal that's most commonly used, and you haven't seen the other lectures, but I make a big deal about the fact that 95% of all metal made is steel. Why wait? 95 pounds out of every 100 pounds of metal is steel. And you'll hear about that and the reasons in the other course, other part of the course. But you want to be able to co cut complex shapes. Now this happens to be plasma cut, and we'll talk about the plasma cutting in a little bit. But here's the edge. You can pass that around and feel a nice smooth edge on a plasma cut piece. That's carbon steel. This is stainless steel, which is plasma cut. I'll pass that around later. This is actually American Welding Society guide for an oxyacetylene cut, or actually oxygen, they just call it oxygen cutting because you can use other gases. We'll probably talk about that. And they have four different standards of smoothness in the last standard, sample four here. I've, I've got a sample downstairs cut by electric boat on HY80. It's a lot smoother than that. It's almost as smooth as the plasma cut. Not quite as smooth as the plasma cut. But uh, you can get fairly smooth cuts. And you can cut, is, has, has anyone here not seen oxyacetylene cutting in real life? You guys have seen it in shipyards, right? Have you seen it? Okay, well, we have show it to you somewhere. Never seen it? Okay. Well, it's actually a fairly rapid process. I mean, if I wanted to cut a one-inch piece of steel, I could start this torch and move it along at kind of that speed, much faster than a bandsaw or anything like that, or a grinding wheel, or anything like that. And a lot cheaper, a lot easier in general. Um, so it turns out you can oxy, you can, you can, you can oxyacetylene cut, or you can oxy, oxygen cut, and all you have to do, well, the problem we have with flames is we get this gas boundary layer, right? Actually, maybe I have my gas boundary layer open in here. I think I do, yeah. So here's my, if I tone it down, in intensity. Come on, guys. Okay, whoops. I hate yellow shoes on this thing. They need to improve the control. Uh, Okay, so there's the gas boundary layer we talked about yesterday. In oxyacetylene cutting, you actually have another chamber in the center. And so you'll have little flames that come out here. And you, you want to get rid of this gas boundary layer. And to, let me erase this, this gas boundary layer right now. To oxyacetylene cut, all you have to do, you have this torch tip that flames come out on either side and you have a central jet of oxygen that you don't turn on initially. So the first thing you do is you bring this thing in, and I usually put it so those little primary cones are just touching the uh, uh, the surface of the steel. I mean, you, you may have some, you'll have some goggles on. This is, uh, you don't have to have a welding helmet, but typically you'll have some, uh, some uh, it's like very, very dark uh, sunglasses, okay, on, uh, because it will be bright. When not, bright, not as bright as an electric arc, won't give you sunburn eyes, but um, it's, it's brighter than you want to, well, actually it would give you sunburn eyes if you look at it long enough, but you have to look at it for a long time. Um, but it's, it's fairly bright, but not like an electric arc. So you have the little primary cone, and you, I just touch it right to the surface. That's about an eighth of an inch, maybe three, three sixteenths of an inch. Just touches the steel surface. And you preheat the surface of the steel. Now, the surface of the steel has got an iron oxide uh, layer. And I'll just call it FeO. Actually, it's probably usually Fe304. It doesn't really matter. And you will start to see, as this thing heats up, even before you see it glow red because you're looking through these dark glasses, uh, you will see the surface just kind of start to, I, I kind of, it's not exactly sparkling back at you, but it kind of, it's not, it's not just sitting there. It's kind of bubbly on a very fine scale. You're getting a, a iron oxide and it starts to bubble a little bit on you. And so you, it just kind of reflects the light a little bit differently right off there. And at that point, you open, you pull a trigger, 
and you get high pressure oxygen shooting down in here. And high pressure, relatively pure, pure the better oxygen. What will happen is I have this iron oxide layer, and if I use the, the other two flames to preheat that and melt the iron oxide surface. The melting temperature of iron oxide is about, I'll put this up in a second, it's 1380C, and the melting point of the steel is 1500C. And so I will essentially, this high pressure oxygen jet will blow away the molten iron oxide, exposing fresh iron underneath to pure oxygen at, at 1300 degrees centigrade. Well, what's going to happen? It's going to react. And when it reacts, it's going to form not Fe304, it will form FeO at those temperatures. And so as a result, if you look over here again at your torch, you and I'm going to blow this up a little bit, you will have, ordinarily you'd like to think that if you have a jet coming in here of oxygen, the oxygen jet's going to flow and give you a boundary layer like that, except I consume all that oxygen. I have no boundary layer because I consume the incoming gas. So there is no flow off to the side, and I can burn right through that thing. When I first cut, turn that thing on, in less than a second, it will drill a hole through a one-inch thick piece of steel. And in fact, you can flame cut, I've seen steel flame cut three feet thick, a three foot thick piece of steel. In fact, in a steel mill, where you got hot steel coming out of the uh, mill, you don't even have to preheat it, they just go in there with a high pressure oxygen lance. Okay, and it just turned the oxygen onto that hot steel, just slice right through it. It might be 10 inches thick, 20 inches thick in the steel mill, and the guy goes in there, and, and there's sparks all over the place because you're taking high pressure gas and blowing it against this stuff and turning molten iron oxide and well, molten uh, iron oxide. And you can cut right through here. Now you got to have a big, a big torch, and you have different size tips for different thicknesses to get nice smooth cuts. So you have to kind of go to the little table that people set up for the gas pressures. Typically, you set your acetylene at five to eight psi acetylene, and then you increase your oxygen pressure for the different increasing depths of the cut, and you use different size tips for for things. But it's just amazing to me how fast it is. It's a chemical reaction, and the heat, you're basically, burn, you literally call it burning metal, and you literally are combusting the iron in pure oxygen. So you are burning through the metal, um, tremendous amount of heat, and remember, I told you that um, the, uh, maybe I didn't, oh yeah, I did. I told you that the heat intensity for an oxyacetylene flame would be 1,000 watts per square centimeter, but I also told you that that 1,000 watts per square centimeter was only 2 to 10 percent efficient in transferring heat to the interface. And that, I told you that the gas boundary layer was the thing that limited that heat transfer. Well, I just got rid of the gas boundary layer, and now I'm nearly 100 percent efficient at transferring heat. And guess what the relative if I looked at heat affected zone sizes and things like that, if I looked at oxygen cutting, it would be up by two orders of roughly two orders of magnitude. I'm generating even more heat, but I'm also, I have no gas boundary layer, and that's proof that it's the gas boundary layer. If I eliminate the gas boundary layer, that same oxyacetylene welding process becomes oxygen cutting with no gas boundary layer, and my heat, relative heat intensity in terms of the rate at which I'm heating up metal and getting rid of it in this case, goes up by almost two orders of magnitude. And that's proof that it's the gas boundary layer. Eliminate the gas boundary layer, eliminate the limitation of my heat transfer. Okay? So it turns out, well, I should have brought one other type of thing. Maybe tomorrow I'll bring it. Uh, I always forget which toys to bring until I start talking. Uh, turns out you can't flame cut everything. Not everything works. So flame cutting, oxygen, flame cutting of iron, oxygen condenses as iron oxide. So I get to use my little thing, okay? Oxygen condenses as iron oxide. There's no boundary layer. The combustion intensity reaches to the theoretical values of 10 to the fifth watts per square centimeter that uh, I 
you know, calculated in terms of just the rate at which gases and heat content is being transferred to the surface. The metal oxide, in order to make this work, the metal oxide should melt below the melting point of the metal. If I have a situation where, let's say this was aluminum, which melts at 660 in the bottom, and the aluminum oxide melts at 2000, and let's say I had a flame and I actually melted some of that aluminum oxide on the surface, well, all the rest of the aluminum would have been molten and would have just fallen apart, right? So that doesn't quite work uh, that way. Um, so basically, one of the requirements, there's going to be one exception here, but one of the requirements is that the melting point of the metal oxide be below the melting point of the metal. And for iron, that works just great. And that means for actually 90 pounds out of 100, because it doesn't work for stainless steel. Okay, very well, we'll talk about that. But, we'll talk about it down here. But for regular steels, low alloy steels, um, things like HY80 or HSLA100 or, or any other structural steels, it works just fine to do oxyacetylene cutting. Aluminum, it doesn't work because the melting point of the oxide is too high. Magnesium, it doesn't work because the melting point of the oxide is too high. Titanium, this is the one I should have brought. You would say it doesn't work, but in fact, in titanium, we talk about the fact once you get above 900 C, titanium will dissolve its own oxide, exposing fresh titanium to the surface. So it turns out you can flame cut titanium. And I told you the story about the guys flame cutting titanium in New York City, didn't I? With the, the yokels uh, uh, who burned down or actually had a minor explosion. You may not have been here that day. Okay. Didn't you miss one of the classes? Okay. Um, but in any case. Um, and chromium, it turns out, stainless steels you can't do because chromium segregates the surface on the stainless steels. That's what gives the stainless steel its stainless character. Chromium oxide sublimes at 2800 C, and the, the steel actually melts at a much lower temperature than 1875. So it turns out you can do iron, you can do titanium. You can't do nickel. I didn't put nickel down here. Um, nickel doesn't work very well uh, by this process. Um, you probably, can you do copper? No, copper has a higher melting point. 1083 for the metal and 13 something for the oxide, for copper oxide, if I remember correctly. So you can't do copper. So it turns out you can only do iron and titanium, but that's about 91% of all metals made, okay? Uh, it's not 95% of all steel because some fraction of steel is stainless steel. But it works for lots of metals in terms of the ones that we have available. So it's widely used. Um, however, more and more, because it will give even smoother cuts, people are using plasma cutting. The problem with plasma cutting, plasma cutting doesn't work on 36 inch thick. In fact, plasma cutting, about the thickest it goes to is about two inch thick. But lots of places are switching to uh, plasma cutting even though the equipment is much, much more expensive. Uh, plasma cutting is just an electric arc. Uh, actually, it's an electric arc jet, jet burner. And I don't think I brought with me my uh, overheads of my old jet burner. I think I left them downstairs. Uh, but remember the jet burner from yesterday? You ignite something in a chamber. Um, in a plasma arc, Plasma arc has a, uh, a tungsten electrode. Well, actually, it's not always tungsten. In this case, it could be something else. I might as well explain plasma arcs in a little more detail. And I'll have a water-cooled copper chamber. So this will be copper, and it'll be water-cooled. And I actually will strike the arc inside between the electro this electrode and the copper and I will get a flame shooting out of here, but all that heating is going on inside the chamber, so it acts like a jet burner, and it comes out of here at very, very high velocity. It comes out at very, very high velocity. I have a flame that'll melt anything. We don't care if it's chromium or aluminum or whatever. I can plasma cut aluminum. I can plasma cut magnesium. I can plasma cut virtually anything in the world. It may not be the, the greatest looking cut in some cases, but I can melt through it because I've got a 10,000 degree Kelvin arc jet flame shooting out of this thing. Um, now it turns out when they first started plasma cutting, 
they had to use, uh, uh, or they were using argon gas, which was pretty expensive. And then they got to nitrogen gas, and that cost money too. But the problem was they had tungsten electrodes. It turns out that they've gotten around that. They found that they go to hafnium, which, say, what's hafnium? Well, it's over there on the periodic table with titanium and vanadium and stuff, okay? Um, it's a, not a widely used metal. In fact, this is probably the largest, one of the largest commercial uses for hafnium, is now to make these electrodes. And the interesting thing about hafnium is that the problem with tungsten is if I, use, if I actually put compressed air through there to make a plasma in, in gas, uh, plasma gas with compressed air, the tungsten oxide, WO3, volatilizes and forms a white smoke at uh, 1,000 degrees centigrade. So you would just oxidize away your tungsten electrode. Not good, okay? Uh, a lot of maintenance on that, that torch. But in hafnium, hafnium forms a protective hafnium oxide, which will also allow some conduction of current through that oxide. So you can use just compressed air if you use a hafnium electrode because it forms this little hafnium oxide layer. And in fact, I think I mentioned these guys wanted to get good thermal contact to the hafnium electrode to keep it cool in this arc so it wouldn't heat up. And they were trying to braze it rather than just mechanically squeeze it, uh, which is what most people did. And they had a hard time bonding to it. And that's where I told you, well, I just told them, well, nickel plate it. And they did. And it works. Okay, so now they can braze to it. Um, anyway, so now you can actually get plasma cutters that just use compressed air, nice and cheap, and uh, use these little hafnium electrodes. And you can buy these things. They're now a little electrical converter. In fact, I, I guess I could probably bring one up if I had to. Um, they're not much bigger than a bread box, literally. And you can go through quarter inch. You can go through sheet metal like mad on this stuff. Just cuts through, cuts through anything. And a big one, which is weighs 100 pounds or 150 pounds, will go through one inch or two inch thick material. So we got maybe, we gotta show that to you. It's down there where you get breakfast and stuff. Uh, commercial equipment, they're not that expensive, a couple thousand dollars, so far as that goes. So that's plasma cutting, um, and it'll melt through anything. There are problems with plasma cutting because it's just a straight thermal process. You're not burning the metal, you're just melting through it and blowing it out of the way. And it turns out, Whenever you turn a corner, you have a problem. And you'll see it actually on that other one that was plasma cut, the complex shape. But I'll pass this around, and someone who has some experience with this would be able to tell you which direction they were going. You could probably figure it out. Because you're preheating the material ahead of you, and when you turn the corner, now you get an asymmetry, and you melt back, and you, you end up with corners that aren't as nice and square and sharp as you might like. And that's still a problem. Um, They've asked me, well, how can, they, how can we stop that? Well, I said, I don't know how you stop fundamentals of fluid flow, uh, heat flow, but uh, I guess they could try. Um, let's go back to oxyacetylene cutting and talk about the things that uh, uh, kind of screw it up. There is a paper that I've given you called the Iron Oxygen Combustion Process. And this goes back to the British Welding Journal in 1955. There, hasn't been, there has been research done on it, but not a lot since then. This was done by uh, uh, Alan Wells, who was uh, a big name in fracture mechanics, and he became head of the British Welding Institute uh, in the 1980s. Um, anyway, there's a plot in there where he's got, and I probably haven't focused this yet. Yeah, probably not. Uh, maybe I'll blow it up. Even more. Okay, so here's the equivalent oxygen purity. And on the bottom is what he calls the relative combustion rate. And it's just fa how fast can you travel along. So for 1.0, he defined low carbon steel as having a relative combustion rate of 1.0. And so he welded, or he didn't weld, he cut with oxyacetylene cutting, a number of different types of steels. Armco iron out here was like 60% uh, uh, higher cutting rate. Swedish iron is up here. Low carbon steel is here. 
free cutting steel, medium carbon steel, high carbon steel, and razor steel, which is, has very high carbon, was only half the rate of low carbon steel. And he explained that the problem here was it's no longer that I'm just burning iron if I'm doing oxyacetylene cutting. I'm burning an iron carbon alloy, and now I'm going to oxidize both the iron to FeO liquid, but what does the carbon oxidize to? CO gas, carbon monoxide gas at these temperatures, or some CO2. If I have CO2 or CO as a gas, I now have brought back my boundary layer. Okay, so this again shows that it's the boundary layer that slows you down. The more carbon you have, the slower you go because it's harder to get the oxygen through. You got to blow away that CO gas or carbon, or carbon dioxide gas, whichever one it is. It's actually a mixture. Um, you have to blow that gas away in order to get the oxygen to the surface, and that creates a problem. He also did tests in nitrogen, or he looked at oxygen purity here, and he found that with 99% pure oxygen, or, well, 98.5%, well, he got, that was his kind of standard, and as he got more and more nitrogen in there, he had an inert that didn't take place, and it basically created the boundary layer by the nitrogen that didn't react. And so he got the same type of slope. He actually found an equivalency that 1% carbon in steel was equal to 6.2% nitrogen in the oxygen. So you have to use high purity oxygen. You can't use low purity oxygen. I was at a welding show once, and these people were using uh, molecular sieves to come up with a cheap way to get oxygen, and they'd come to market their wares. And um, I stopped by, and they saw the MIT name, and they started asking me about things, and they told me that what there's, they could produce 92% oxygen just by compressing air into these molecular sieves at one pressure, and then changing some valves, and you, they would essentially absorb the oxygen onto these molecular sieves. They would pump away the nitrogen, and then they would open the thing up, change the valves, open the thing up, and they would have up to 92% oxygen. And they thought this was going to be a wonderful thing to do oxy oxygen cutting. And they'd come to the welding show and taken a booth out, and they were trying to sell this. Okay? And they asked me what I thought, and I said, I don't think you got enough purity. Because if you went back to Allen Wells, and I, you know, I told them, they had to go back to this type of plot. Of course, they didn't know anything about it. They were just a bunch of chemists who thought they had a product. And it probably was a good part for some things, but not for oxygen cutting of steel. Because if you're down to 92% or whatever they had, they would have lost one-third of their productivity. Okay? Not everybody's going to buy that, even if it is cheaper, okay, than buying pure oxygen. Oxygen is not that, that expensive in compressed gas tanks. Okay? So that's most of what we want to do on cutting. Any questions on cutting? Nope. Okay, well, I told you that one way to get rid of this boundary layer is to use or to react it away and form a liquid uh, rather than your incoming gas. The other way happens to be an electric arc. If you remember, our good old electric arcs gave us heat intensities that were 10 times the heat intensity of a oxyacetylene flame. So I got 10 times the heat intensity with arc welding. Actually, I haven't shown it quite 10 times, but it's eight times, whatever it is. No, nine is 10, eight is 10, anything, you know. Pardon me? That's right, on a log scale, anything above three, well, on a log scale, three is halfway to 10, right? On a geometric scale. So, see, you're from MIT, you can understand that. I say that to my kids, and they go, huh? Okay. Huh? <laughs> That's good they don't understand? Huh. Anyway, um, so one other way to do this is it turns out an electric arc, 90%, and we'll prove this later, of the heat in electric arc. 
is carried by the electrons. And the electrons actually are coming across here with enough energy that they basically just punch right through that boundary layer. They are not, the, the boundary layer is, is a colder region we'll talk about in a little bit. There's not a lot of charged particles in there for those electrons to get interfered with. There is up in the plasma, okay, where there's a bunch of positive ions to neutralize the charge. But in the gas boundary layer, you're at a lower temperature. And essentially, the electrons just punch their way right through that electric, that thing. And you get 90% of your heat carried through by the electrons. So if I get 10%, 1,000 watts per square centimeter from the hot gas, I'll get 90% from the electrons. And that gives me a factor of 10 improvement. Ta-da. See? So an electric arc, I just call an electric arc an electrically augmented flame. Now. I don't know if I've got it in here. I call it an electrically aug augmented flame. But Carl Taylor Compton, who was the president, president of MIT back in the 1930s, but started out at Princeton as a professor of physics, said, an arc is a discharge in a gas or vapor with a voltage drop in the cathode region that is on the order of the lowest ionization potential of the gas or vapor in which it burns. Hmm. Tell that to your kids. OK. What did he say? OK. Well. Actually, I mean, his is a more precise definition. Turns out there were, there were lots of studies of arcs. It was a very popular su subject in the 1920s and the 1930s. F and even into the 1950s, um, it, was, it was interesting from a scientific point of view in the 1920s and 1930s to understand electric arcs. Um, there were some interesting quantum mechanics of how the electrons get out of the cathode. Uh, and we still don't really understand it. I've got a book downstairs that lists the 25 different theories. This book's only about 10 or 15 years old, OK? So we still have many theories. The physicists can't figure it out. And even quantum mechanics doesn't really allow them to explain it very well. We'll, we'll describe a, a little theory later. But uh, um, basically, there's some interesting physics in arcs. Um, and I remember when I started out uh, early in my career, when was this? This was like 1981 or so. Um, the Office of Naval Research offered me a lot of research money to try to get more people interested in welding. And I went right down here, over here to the Harrison Spectroscopy Laboratory, and talked to the, the young professor who was there. And he says, well, well, why would anyone want to study arcs? And I said, well, it's important in welding and stuff. And he says, well, we know everything about arcs. And I said, well, there's still a few things that we don't quite understand. Oh, no, we understand everything. <laughs> and I, was, I actually had money from the Navy to give to this guy, OK? And uh, uh, anyway, he, he wasn't interested. And I went over and talked to Professor Hart in mechanical engineering. And we ended up doing some other stuff with some of the Navy money. But in any case, the physicists thought, and they still think they understand uh, everything about uh, these uh, these one atmosphere welding arcs. Well, in fact, they don't. And what I learned over the next 10 years is the physicists don't want to study welding arcs. Because welding arcs have a real serious problem. They're not mathematically tractable. Okay? Physicists like to study either weakly ionized arcs, where I have one ion surrounded by a bunch of neutral atoms. Because mathematically, they can handle that. Or they like to study fully ionized arcs, where I have every, every particle either has a positive or a negative charge. OK? Because they can handle that mathematically. It turns out a welding arc is only 5 to 30% ionized, and therefore, it's a partially ionized arc. OK? It's not weakly, and it's not fully. It's partially. called call it partially ionized arc. Well, it turns out the physicists can't handle that mathematically. They don't know what to do with it. So rather than actually worry about it, they declare victory and say, we already understand it. There's no need to work on it. Okay? That's not what they told me. That's what I, took me 10 years to figure out that that's the game they play. So it turns out not a lot of people like to study welding arcs, but there, has, there have been lots of studies of welding arcs. And you got a nice little handy-dandy handout here. I'm going to switch again to 
this other thing, that will describe the physics. Oh, actually, I should have, shouldn't have done that. Let me go back to my base. Oops, I went too far. No, I'm not going to know where I am. Um, an arc. Can't do that. It's going to get in here. A welding arc is an electrically augmented plane. That's the Tom Eager definition. That's not the Carl Taylor, Taylor Compton definition. But I can understand mine. I can't understand his. Okay, so it's an electrical augmented flame. You've got an electrode up here. You've got a base plate down here. Typically, when you first start setting arcs, you make the electrode negative. That's where the electrons are coming from. And they come down and they strike the base plate. And if you measure the voltage across that gap, you will find where Z is the axial dimension, you'll find the voltage has a very steep temperature gradient right up in here. That's called the cathode fall region. And it's a fairly, it's less than a millimeter in length. And then you have what's called the plasma column where you have less voltage gradient. And then you have the anode fall down here where you have a steep voltage gradient again. And in fact, if I go back to Carl Taylor Compton, he says, an arc is a discharge in a gas. He means an electrical discharge in a gas or vapor with a voltage drop in the cathode region, da, 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 voltage drop in the cathode region, that is on the order of the lowest ionization potential of the gas or vapor in which it burns. Well, if this is argon, that voltage drop in that little sub-millimeter region around the tip of that electrode is going to be on the order of the ionization potential of the gas. If it's argon, the first ionization potential is 15 volts. Okay, and on the order of, in this case, means 5 volts. Okay, it's not 15 volts. It turns out to be a smaller fraction, but we'll see what, what all that means. So that's what Carl Taylor Compton said an arc was. Uh, and I already told you that in the plasma, well, in, that 99% of the carry, current is carried by the electrons in a high pressure arc. Well, what do we mean by high pressure arc? One atmosphere pressure gas is what the physicists, physicists call a high pressure arc, and we'll I'll show you something on that in a second. In the plasma column, that voltage gradient is about 10 volts per centimeter. So I may have three or four volts drop here. I will have three or four or five volts drop down here in the anode region. And so let's say I have a total of eight volts up there and eight, or a total of, let's just call it four volts up here and four volts down here, a total of eight volts. And then the length of the arc, because this region is also a submillimeter is about 10 volts per centimeter. So if I've got a centimeter long arc, I'm going to have about 18 volts. Okay, And you know that gas tungsten arcs are about 15 volts. They might be a little less than a centimeter. Or you don't know that, but they are. Um, you may know that. And a, a gas metal arc might be 30 volts, because it has a little bit longer uh, plasma column. So that's the... Um, um, those ionization potentials and things that he was talking about. Now, it turns out that you've got this in your handout. If a physicist looks at an arc, and I actually, uh, I found it very, very useful when I go to engineering conferences to just use physicists, physicists, physicists as my foil. Okay, and just slam them. Okay, because they they like to get up in their pompous way. They act like they're almost like they're British, and I show that sometimes. And people who are British know exactly what I'm talking about. They like to get up. I mean, if you ever go to a conference and someone stands up after your talk and asks the question, they have a, a British accent. Get ready for a real zinger. Okay, because they just love to try to put people down, and I love to just slam them back. Okay. Um, and I, I actually am pretty good at it, <coughs> if I do say so myself. And so actually the Brits don't ask me very many questions anymore. <laughs> Put them in their own place. Okay, if you look at the voltage in arcs, and this is a function of current, the arc that we're, we know is down here in the several tens of volts. And that's what they call the high pressure arc. Or actually, yeah, that's the high pressure arc. Um, and then as you get to lower and lower currents, and this, this high pressure arc will go from, let's say, 10 amps up to several thousand amps, or actually go up to 50,000 or 100,000 amps or more, 
but we don't. We only weld with it down in this region of uh, one to a thousand amps typically, and there's some good reasons for that. But if you go below one amp, you're not generating enough heat to keep everything ionized, and the voltage has to go up to increase the power when you have less current, so you get a more constant power. And if you keep on going to even lower currents, you actually have to drop the pressure, and you get to something called uh, abnormal glow in a glow. Well, a glow discharge is nothing more than a fluorescent light. Here we got fluorescent lights up here, right? A fluorescent light is nothing more than electric arc at low pressure and relatively low currents, but high voltages. Those fluorescent lights have some sort of ballast transformer for a good one in them, and it'll go up to a couple thousand volts. Okay, and there's that's just because to sustain it at that kind of current, you have to have enough power, and the thing will start glowing. Um, we're going to see some interesting things about that, and then you keep on going down, um, you get into what they call dark discharge. We don't have to worry about the physics of those because those are we don't have to worry about it because those are well beyond anything that we would deal with in our normal experience. Okay. Now, another way to look at all this is to look at the pressure of the arc. What atmosphere pressure is over here? This is the high pressure arc versus temperature. And this is looking at um, this plot is looking at temperature of the electrons, T minus, those are the, the minus charged particles or the electrons, the plus charge, the ions, and the gas, the neutral atoms. And it turns out in a high pressure arc, and this is how the physicists define a high pressure arc, which is not a bad way to do it, even if they are physicists, um, is to say that we have local thermodynamic equilibrium where the temperature of the electrons, the ions, and the gas are all the same, or are very close to the same. And that's called LTE, local thermodynamic equilibrium, and that's up in here. If you go to lower pressures and you start to getting down to our fluorescent lights, it turns out the electrons still have very high temperatures on the order of 10,000 degrees or 20,000 degrees Kelvin. But the gas ions, or the, the ions and the gas, have temperatures that are not much above um, a couple hundred degrees Kelvin or 300 degrees Kelvin. And that's why a fluorescent light, if you hold on to it, is cold. All the heat capacity is in those, those ions and gas molecules. The electrons have very little heat capacity compared to a gas atom. They're, not, they're much lighter, and therefore the heat capacity is less. And the reason they give off light without a lot of heat is because you're heating up just the electrons. You're not heating up the ions and the neutrals. Well, how can that be? Well, what's happened is in a high-pressure arc, these particles are so close to each other that they're banging into each other and equalizing temperature between electrons and ions and neutrals all the time. If I go to a low pressure arc, um, like a fluorescent light, I may now have a hundred times the molecular distance as a spacing, and those electrons get accelerated. They're very light in that electric field. They get accelerated a lot before they run into anything. And therefore, they pick up a lot of energy and will have a very high temperature Whereas those, even those ions, they are so heavy, so sluggish, their mean free path is less in terms of hitting other, other particles, that they don't get accelerated at the same rate by the, the electric field. So I actually end up with a two-fluid model, if you will, an electron fluid at very high temperature and a neutral down here. And that's why fluorescent lights are more efficient to use but the big new thing in lighting is what? Anybody know? LEDs, right? Lasers. They now, since they have blue lasers, they can make white light by putting red, green, and blue together. And there are literally billions of dollars being spent right now. Um, and in fact, I just saw at the store, they're selling a LED flashlight now, okay? And it's going to be, eventually, you're going to have wall panels that just emit light into a room. And those, those LED flashlights, they say the batteries last uh, 50 times as long or something. Well, they've got them up to they're bright enough. 
And that's the first thing, but eventually in the next few years, you're going to, we're not going to, we're quit using incandescent lights. Incandescent lights just generate a lot of heat, which is waste energy. It's not producing light. Essentially, the laser is just heating up the electrons. The rest of the laser, the silicon or the gallium arsenide or whatever, is not, the gallium nitride with the blue, is not even getting warm. So you don't have all this waste, waste heat. Fluorescent lights are, you know, two-thirds more efficient because you're not generating all that waste heat because the gas inside there is not getting very hot. Incandescent lights are about the worst of all possible cases where, uh, yeah, I'm getting the electrons hot, but I have to get everything else hot too. And that heat is waste heat. So incandescent lights give you lots of heat, which is wasted. Fluorescent lights give you less heat, wasted heat. And these new LED lights are going to give off light even more efficiently, and so your batteries will last forever. So I should buy one of those things, huh? Okay. <laughs> okay.